Are you all excited to be here tonight? Come on. God is good. Uh, this is my second week getting to teach after getting a partner with pastors Jonathan and Marlene. Don't you love them? Can we give it up for Jonathan and Marlene? Just amazing people. Love them so much. Uh, if you would, turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel 11. We're going to get there in a second. Uh, last week, I talked about, uh, the title of my message last week was, You're Not You When You're Hungry. And uh, yes, I did steal that from the Snickers slogan, um, but I did not get it from Snickers. What we talked about was how we are, uh, how we need to be as believers in Jesus, satisfied in him. We centered on this verse. It wasn't, I didn't expect to, but we centered on this verse in Psalm 109.7. For he, for God, satisfies the longing soul. We should have that scripture. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. We weren't just talking about a desire for food, but we were talking about how we need to be satisfied in Jesus. And two ways we talked about that was through God's word. Everyone say God's word. And through God's presence. Everyone say God's presence. Uh, it was it was powerful. The Lord moved. I believe we had over 14 people give their lives to Jesus for the first time. Can we give God some praise for that? It was awesome. God's moving. And uh, the Lord is good. I'm going to give you sort of a part two tonight on this. If you're taking notes, uh, write down the title of the message tonight is My Life's Work. My Life's Work. I'm going to give you a little part two, though, in uh, how we are can be satisfied in doing God's will, doing God's will. Uh, I'm going to give you a little intro here, but this is, here we go. Every created thing ought to be used for what it was created for. Can you imagine uh, seeing something created for a specific design not being used for that? What if you saw an iPhone being used as a drink coaster? What would you think if you saw a Louis Vuitton purse being used as a doggy bag? How would you react to an Apple laptop being used as a dinner plate? Or a $100 bill being used as a napkin? Some of you think baller. <laughs> and I think stupid. <laughs> okay. What about a Tesla being used as a storage unit? Or what about a 1999 first edition holographic Charizard card being used as a toothpick to pull out cilantro out of your teeth from eating tacos? <laughs> that last one was ridiculous. <laughs> and I have to be honest, I laughed when I wrote it down, okay? <laughs> Every single person under the sound of my voice was created on purpose for a purpose. Whether or not you believe it, the truth is that Father God designed you in such a specific way to, for you to answer a specific call. He is the creator, and we are the created. If we don't fully give our lives over to God for him to decide what he made us for, we will live every single day of our lives, feeling like a square peg trying to fit in a round hole. It just doesn't work. Ephesians 2.10 in the New Living Translation, it says this, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. These are things that God has mapped out for our lives that was before we were ever born. He's created a life plan for you. I remember being in high school, and the question I hated was, what do you want to do with your life? What do you want to do with your life? I'm like, I'm still a teenager. My brain isn't fully formed. Why are you asking me what I want to do with my life? I didn't react that way. <laughs> because I didn't know that my brain wasn't fully formed when I was a teenager. But we don't know 
when we're especially young and growing up, we don't know what we're supposed to do with our whole lives. And yet we have a God who's planned out our life for us with good things that we are supposed to walk in. But part of the reason that believers neglect their God-given purpose is because they ignore Jesus as their Lord. Lord is a word that means master and decision maker. And they want to keep him as savior, yet hold on to the old life of sin. So they live in a perpetual state of being rescued and never living out God's plan. The only way one can truly find their God-given purpose is to fully hand over their life to God and entrust every detail to his careful, loving, wise, precious hands that mold us, shape us, and bring us into the most fulfilled, exhilarating, satisfied life we could ever imagine. I felt like the Amplified Bible saying that. (laughs) So let's talk about lordship. Everyone say lordship. What we teach here at The Rock is when you give your life to Jesus, you give your life to Jesus as your savior. Is anybody excited about that? He has saved us from our sin. His death on the cross saved us cleansed us from so we do not have a sin issue that is a barrier between us and god anymore and we also teach the bible that says we give our lives to him as our savior but also our lord if you get savior right but you don't get lord right you are like a pig getting a shower and jumping back into the mud every day of your life Here's how I know this, because I was a youth pastor for six years, and I would give altar calls all the time. You know what an altar call is? It's an invitation to receive Jesus. Some of my youth are in this room, and y'all know, and I'm, I'm talking about some of you. <laughs> because I would say, if you want to give your life to Jesus, come forward, and we're praying for you. And the person who gave their life to Jesus last week would come up this week. And in my mind, I'm thinking... Did you give your life to him or not? What is this? The Bible says we're being born again. You coming out the womb every single week. Stop jumping back in there. Now, I was not thinking that sarcastically, if I can be honest. But what we don't understand is that we've given Savior. He's cleansed me. Now, I can, there are, I can make mistakes. Like, we, we make mistakes. We may sin and mess up from there, but that does not mean that we need to have him jump back on the cross for us again. That's done. So I can confess my sin, boop, clean, right again. But we follow him as our Lord. Everyone say Lord. If you don't get this in your life with Jesus, it's constantly uncomfortable. Constantly. It's like a... It's like a it's like a, everybody had a naked dream. Do you know what I mean? Like when you're in, in your dream, you're naked. Like you show up to school and you're like, ah, shoot. Where are my clothes? You know what I'm saying? I remember like specifically as a kid, like second grade class, for some reason it started in second grade. I run to the back of the class and I'm like trying to cut holes out of my backpack in my dream. Like step in it, just, you know, I'm wearing my back. <laughs> that is so much detail. For those of you visual thinkers, I really apologize for that last journey I took you on. Um, I don't even know what I was talking about. Oh, uh oh. (laughs) Lordship. (laughs) If you don't get lordship right, you are constantly uncomfortable. If he is not your decision maker, your master, you're constantly uncomfortable. Because you're constantly picking up your life and putting it down. You come into church, I give you my life. You walk out, you pick it back up. You'll never be comfortable because you were not designed to be in control. You were designed to be in the passenger seat of your life. And we have a wonderful driver. He is the Uber driver of our soul. (laughs) Oh, you ain't going to be hearing worship songs about that. Could you? (laughs) Okay. I'm not even going to go there. Okay. 
<laughs> Is that in the message? Is he the Uber driver of our... Okay. <laughs> lordship. Everyone say lordship. Okay. I need to listen to the Lord right now. Okay. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says this in the New Living Translation. It says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord, everyone say Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's raining, everyone. Californians. We stop and listen to it. Okay. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. This is an interesting little passage here because a lot of people think I can believe in my heart and never live it out loud. Yeah, I can put a a profile update on my Instagram and say, heart Jesus, and that means I'm a follower, and it's not. Unless your life speaks louder than your words, Scripture's clear. Plus, do we really believe it if we don't live it? Because the word believe means to live by. If I believe that a chair will hold me up, then I'm going to sit down, not like, is it going to... Is it going to catch me? No, I'm just going to sit. And if you believe that Jesus is real, you will openly declare your faith that you are saved. Everyone say lordship. We've got to get that right. And for some of you, I'm just going to say, like, you need to get this settled in your heart right now. You need to get it settled in your heart right now. You will never live out your life's work if you don't let his lordship be in place in your heart. You ever heard that phrase, my life's work? My life's work. This is my life's work. Some people so put it on a project. Maybe, maybe it's a painter, some kind of artist. And it's like their ultimate piece, their ultimate project. This is my life's work. And I think of even someone like David. What's going to be said at his memorial service on Saturday? The few words that we say over his life, define his life's work. Was he selfish, self-centered, all about him? No, quite the opposite. He was giving all about others, ready to love other people. That was his life's work. And our life's work as believers in Jesus, most simply put, is to do God's will. Everyone say God's will. To do God's will, what God wants for our lives. Because we can't just slap a Christian sticker on our backs and do whatever we want. This is a wake up call for some of you because you don't get, this is not your life anymore. If you want your sin back, you can have the rest of your life too. If you want to be separated from God, you pick back, you pick your life back up. Did you give it to him or not? Because some people want like, I want the heaven card, but I want to keep the earth life. It's all the same. And the Bible even compares our relationship to Jesus as a marriage. Ladies, you get that. You're like, yes, I am the bride of Christ. Thank you, Lord. The veil... The veil's come off. I'm yours, Lord. I know as a man, like the get, being the bride of Christ was a little, that was a little hard to grasp. <laughs> how do, I don't know how to get that. But this is reality, right? Marriages don't work when you make a commitment and keep the side girlfriends. Marriages don't work when you make the commitment, but you still want to live your life of eight hours of video games a day. <laughs> Why? Why was that one louder than the girlfriends? Somebody's like, somebody's like, yeah, you hear that? Four seats down. The guy who's interested in me put the video games away. Okay. <laughs> I have no one in mind. Anyways, <laughs> even though I do know like a huge group of guys is going to be playing video games all weekend. But anyways, um, moving on. I'm totally kidding. When I was 19 years old, uh, some of you know my story, but I grew up in church. I was, I was the church kid. Like, I grew up in church all the time. And when I was uh, a teenager, I had some really rocky stuff hit my family. 
And I just was engulfed in a life of sin. As a 11 year old, maybe I was, I stumbled across pornography and I was bound and I hated who I was. I would come to church, play the church thing and live just bound on the inside, hating myself. When I laid my pillow, laid my head on the pillow at night, I hated it. I hated who I was. I hated being bound to that spirit. It was disgusting. I wanted out. I didn't know how to get out. And the turmoil in, turmoil in my home didn't help anything. But when I was 18, 19, I'm seeking the Lord. And if I got to be honest, I felt like that square peg in a round hole because I was pursuing my own path. I was, I, my thing was I wanted to play college basketball. I was good at basketball. I'm still good at basketball. I'm just not as fast, okay? And my body just doesn't work. But, um, <laughs> but I was pursuing that for a year. I was doing what they call red shirting. So you save a year of eligibility and I was getting ready to go to a four year. And I went and, and I went and tried out for this one team. I remember I drove three hours away to go try out for this team. And it was like, my dad has this saying, I, like I couldn't hit my butt with both hands. I just, just nothing was working. Like I couldn't, I was playing horrible. And I, I drove three hours home. Like God, I literally feel like you're against me in this. I remember it. I remember feeling like if this was God's plan for my life, you are not helping me out at all. I feel like I'm going into a headwind. I feel like I am like treading water. This is not working. And I'll never forget in those weeks of my life, I'm asking God, God, show me what to do. And a pastor here at church came up to me and he said, hey, we've got this young adult internship. Matter of fact, we have, its, we have a summer one that's like a try it out and just, just come and give God a few weeks of your life, you know? And so I told the Lord, Lord, I trust you that if I give you these few weeks, you'll get me into the college that I need to get into. <laughs> and God's like, I'm going to answer part of that prayer, okay? I'll never forget it. I actually, I was right in the back, right over there in that corner, with a worship song playing, and I lost it. I completely lost it. Completely broke down because my entire life, I had no idea what it was like to be in God's will. I had no idea. And it had nothing to do with because I did an internship. It had nothing to do with the, the, the means. It, ha it just had to do with this. I just clicked into God's will for my life. And I have to tell you, I've never been out of it since. It, it was an exhilarating feeling. I, I'm walking around like I don't understand what's going on, but it's like, it's like I was living in black and white. And I'm living in color. I, I don't get it. I just clicked into the will of God for my life. But I had to do this. I had to give up my old one. I actually remember the scripture that says, if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. And that's what I knew. I knew God saying, you give me your life, you're going to find it. And I, I promise you, and I'm not joking, for so many years of my life, I played basketball for hours a day. And I'm not kidding. From one day to the next, done. And I didn't miss it. Because the Bible says anybody who looks back is not fit for the kingdom. I didn't look back. I didn't look back. I stopped. I stopped the regiments that I had. I stopped the focus that I had. And I just went full on after Jesus. And I never looked back. And you can see somebody's life like mine. And I don't know what your outside opinion of it is. But I'm crazy blessed. I have an amazing wife. I have four sons. I get to do the ultimate dream job. I love being a part of our church staff here. And that was not my original goal. That was not, that's not the purpose for everybody either. But this was God's will for my life. And I am in it and I am loving it because how God made me, he made me for this season. It's been the most thrilling ride I've ever had. 
It's like in Finding Nemo when they jump into the East Australian current. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm saying? Righteous, righteous, you know? Like, that, that's how it feels. That's like so spiritual. Oh, no, I'm like, righteous, that's righteousness of God. That's who I am. And I'm zooming. And you just realize, what was I doing before? I'm str- swimming on my own strength. <laughs> I'm not getting anywhere. And the Lord just, whoosh, and I'm gone. Like, that's how my life has been ever since. Ever since. Getting into God's will for your life is awesome. But you can't do it without lordship. This is the first step, plain and simple. And you better get used to it. <laughs> you better get used to it. The Bible says your life is not your own. You were bought at a price, the price of Jesus on the cross. You were purchased. You don't belong there anymore. And I, I want to give us a little bit of a sober reminder tonight, if actually I feel like the Lord wants to, of what happens when we take a break from being in God's will. Can we take a break? Do you get to be a... Do you get to take a vacation from being a Christian? Go in your Bible to 2 Samuel 11, and I'm going to read these scriptures to you here, three scriptures that are going to deeply impact you. A lot of people talk about David. David was, a, David was like one of the top dogs in the Bible. The, the, he was defined as the man after God's own heart. He, he won battles. He, he killed Goliath, right, this, this huge man. David just wiped out armies. Like David did some unbelievable things in his life. But David had a moment where he took a break from being in God's will. He took a break and it cost him dearly. Second Samuel 11, one through three, it says, it happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab, his commander, and his servants with him, and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah? the Hittite. David asks about this woman. Now David's the king, okay? No police are just stepping up going, whoa, hey, this is somebody else's wife. He's the king. What he says goes. See, this guy Uriah that's mentioned here was one of David's mighty warriors. So David knows who this man is. He has a relationship with him. But back it up to verse 1, because I want to show you the crux of this chapter right here, where everything swings. It says, at the time when kings go out to battle, David was at home. David was at home. David was resting when he should have been fighting. David was isolated when he should have been surrounded by his brothers. And if you take a break from being in the will of God, you are a walking target. I used to love watching Animal Planet when I was a kid. Anybody like Animal Planet? Yeah, grew up on it. Animal Planet and ESPN, man. I could name any stat and I could talk about any animal. Loved it. But you know those awesome, I loved them. You know those awesome, you got the African plains. You got the, little, you got the lionesses that are like stalking in the, in the tall grass. You got this pack of zebras. And you got a little, little Timmy zebra in the back there. Little Timmy just got born. Little Timmy can't run fast. Little Timmy can't keep up with mommy and daddy. <laughs> and little Timmy's in trouble. <laughs> Because the lions stalk, and you know who they're after? They're after the weak one. And so what happens? They ambush. All the zebras take off in different directions. Little Timmy, you're dust, bro. You're done. I just know it. 
Those lioness, they're too smart. They got you. Because you got isolated from the pack. That's their goal, right? They're not going to run at the big strong ones because they can't necessarily take them down. They'll, you know, kick you, like get, get rid of you. But the isolated ones get taken out. Are you isolated? Do you like to handle things on your own? Do you say this quote? We talk about this a lot, but do you say this quote? I get my life fixed up before I come to church. No, this, this body of believers is a hospital for the broken, not a landing place for the perfect. When you get isolated, when you should be at war and you're chilling at home, this is when the enemy will take you out. If you know the story, David ends up sending for her, sleeping with her, gets her pregnant. Then he tries to cover it up by killing her husband. Well, he actually tries to get her husband drunk to send him home to be with his wife and covered up. Then he ends up organizing a plot to kill him. And finally, after a long time, a prophet comes and confronts David and says, basically, you're the one who sinned against God. And David, in his heart for the Lord, quickly repents and turns. And God forgives. But I will say this. God forgives him, but there were still consequences. That baby died. Listen to me. Do not fall for the trap that your sin does not have consequences. Don't fall for it. I'm telling you, don't fall for it. Sin always has consequences. We can be forgiven and right before God, but do not fall for the trap that the devil loves to do. Now you can sin today. You'll be it beyond tomorrow and you'll get things right before God. You no, you can sin again. There's forgiveness for that. There's grace for that. Mm, Grace for that. No. What is that? That's like my, me walking, holding hands with my wife and just checking out whoever I want. No, that does not bring relationship. That does not bring fruitfulness. That does not bring progression in me walking in the will of God. Sin always has consequences. And doing God's will is fulfilling. It's not easy. This cheap gospel has been preached in America from time to time where it's like, hey, just come on in. You're in the family of God now. We love, you're going to be blessed. That's awesome. And it's like, yeah, and they don't forget, they forget to tell you, you also have to die to your old life. What is baptism? I die and I come up new in Jesus. And everything I've done before is dead under that water. Why are we ignoring that? And then we wonder why people come in and out of church, in and out of church, never solid, because you didn't realize you need to die. And you need to pick up the owner's manual that God has for your life and live by it. Luke 9.23 says, Jesus talking, Then he said to them, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Did he say be perfect? No. But I will tell you this. We are a part of a generation who is not being trained to deny yourself of anything. Follow your heart. I ain't going to. No, I'm going to do it. Don't ever follow your heart. Don't ever. Your heart is stupid. You have a stupid heart. Stupid, stupid little heart. (laughs) No, the Bible says this. The Bible says that your heart is deceitfully wicked. It will trick you. It will trick you. It will play games with you. And it's right here, right in your chest, right all up in there. It will trick you. And this world is teaching. Oh, hey, man, do whatever you want to do. Follow your heart. Do whatever. Do what feels right to you. That's stupid. That is so dumb. If my four-year-old sees a snake and is like, hey, that looks fun to play with. Don't do what feels good to you, dude. That is stupid. You run the other direction. And Jesus teaches us that running the other direction from sin is not running away from something. It's running to someone. (laughs) 
Zach, if you could come up, that would be great. We're going to close in a minute. <clears throat> you know, Jesus lived out his life's work. Did you know that? Jesus had a life's work. Jesus had an end goal. Jesus walked in the will of God. The Bible says that Jesus said about, about God, I don't do anything unless I see the Father do it. What was he saying? Even Jesus was saying, my life is not my own. And he modeled it for us. He modeled it for us. In Luke 22, 41 through 42, right before Jesus is going to the cross, he says this, and he, Jesus, was withdrawn from his disciples about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. This is a moment where Jesus is, may I say it, like vulnerable. He gives us insight to what he was going through. Jesus comes to the Father and says, right now, I don't want to do this. If there's any other way, let's go that route. Nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want. We have so many Christians who are unsatisfied, about as on fire as a wet rag. Because we live every day for what we want. And we don't wake up and say, today, not my will, but yours be done. Didn't Jesus teach us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done? Yeah, and we can nod and get excited in church, but how much of your life is submitted? Because I'd submit to you that 80% is not your whole life. You can't turn the lights off in the corners with God. He sees it all. And I am not saying this in a way of judgment. I am not saying this in a way that you're not doing good and those kinds of things. I say this to liberate you. You will be liberated when your whole life is given to the Lord. You will be set free. There is nothing more fulfilling. Right? Nothing more freeing. You will constantly, every day of your life, feel like something is missing if you don't give it all to Him. And your life's work is to do God's will. Your life's work is not to give glory to you. It's not to do something to make your name great. It's to make his name great. And I want to show you the last minutes, last seconds, really, of Jesus' life. Show you how he finished. Because we don't talk about how we finish a lot, but I didn't really think about it, but we'd be talking about David. But the end of your life speaks. There's no more words to say. And you don't just get to, uh, you don't just get to like live your life now and I'll give my life to Jesus later. You don't know when the end is. But in John 19, 28 through 30, right as Jesus is up on the cross, we're going to put all three verses up. It says this, after this, knowing that all things were accomplished, Jesus had gone through the entire process. Boy can't imagine what was going on in his heart and mind in that moment now that all, knowing that all things were accomplished that the scripture might be fulfilled he said i thirst now a vessel of sour wine was sitting there and they filled a sponge with sour wine put it on hyssop which is a plant and put it to his mouth so when jesus had received the sour wine he said it is finished and bowing his head he gave up his spirit what does this I thirst mean? Jesus didn't accept the pain numbing drink that was offered to him at the beginning of the cross. So as not to take a pain reliever for your sin. But now he accepts a taste of greatly diluted wine to wet his parched lips and his dry throat so he could make one final announcement to the world which echoes for eternity. As this wine was lifted to his mouth, it was put on hyssop, the same hyssop plant that would have taken any Jew back to the saving blood of the Passover lamb. 
as the hyssop plant is lifted to his mouth, Jesus announces that the price has been paid for our sin once and for all. Jesus' last words, not words of defeat, but rather the greatest words of victory ever spoken, it is finished. Jesus had made peace with God and man, and he removed the debt that no sinful man could pay. It is finished was a conqueror's cry, spoken with a loud voice, the cry of the victorious one, with no ounce of defeat. What was finished? The types, promises, and prophecies were finished. The sacrifices and ceremonies of the Old Testament priests were finished. His perfect obedience was finished. The satisfaction of God's wrath and justice on sin, finished. The power of Satan, sin, and death, finished. Charles Spurgeon said, Has he finished his work for me? Then I must get to work for him. And I must persevere until I finish my work. Not to save myself, for that is done, but because I am saved. Jesus bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus did not hang his head in defeat. He bowed it in peace. He gave up his spirit. No one took it from him. John 10 says, I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. Will you finish? Will you finish? That doesn't just mean are you going to live the last few life, last few years of your life great. But how you live now determines how you finish. How you live now determines how you finish. Everyone say this. Say, my life's work is to do God's will. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Can we stand to our feet? sense we're supposed to take a really long time to respond to this but I I really feel like I'm going to give you about 60 seconds and you tell the Lord what you need to tell him tell him what you need to leave behind make a commitment to move forward I'll put this verse up on the screen Jeremiah 29 13 and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart when I when I stumbled into that place of saying yes to the Lord. I, I was not this super wise Christian and I, I felt like I was a toddler in the Lord and God just came and grabbed my hand and was like, you're going to come? You're going to come with me? You don't have to be some amazing Christian to follow God and hear his voice. The Bible says that if you're a son of God, you can be led by God. Plain and simple. But it's the way we come to him offering our lives to him. So, 60 seconds, every one of us, let's respond to the Lord and under, mutter under your breath what you need to make right before the Lord. God, we come to you right now.
Father, we delight to do your will. We want to do your will, Lord. God, I pray for people who even today, tonight, they're saying, they're stepping into your will and saying, God, I don't even know where to go. Somebody needs to quit a job. I just know it inside. Somebody needs to quit a job, like with no promise of pay. I'm not saying that for everyone who has a job. I'm just saying somebody in here, you know that God is talking to you and you need to quit a job. Somebody in here needs to pray about not pursuing the career path that you're on. Some of you need to pray about not going to school for what you're going to school for. And don't give yourself that excuse like, yeah, but I've put so much into it. I've put so much money into it. The Bible says that God restores the years that the devil took from us. And so he'll restore everything back that you need. Lord Jesus, we love you. We want to walk in your will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.